think back to before the year 2000. Oof. What was your favorite, whether it's a concert or on TV at an award show, what was your favorite performance? Before 2000. Before 2000. It was probably, I want to say like the, um, probably something Spice Girls or something, honestly. Like I wasn't paying attention to like reward shows and stuff too much. Or maybe like the VMAs, the 1999 VMAs. I think that's when like Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, everybody was there. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was like one of the first award shows that I remember really paying attention to Mm -hmm. and really like enjoying it. Like Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the Waynes Brothers, them hosting it, even though they were terrible in that job. I remember (laughs) Macy Gray was furious. Oh, so yeah, there probably was so just much that happening show. around that award show. That was a really bizarre award show. Like yeah. that patch, that like 1999, 2000, 2001, that was some really weird years for award shows. That's when we have the transition. And now people are dressing, are not treating award shows like award shows. It's weird. Because they don't really hand out awards. They just perform. And there's no kind of story between <laughs> the events that happen. It's just... Please welcome our next performer. Please welcome our next performer. There's not like monologues and stuff in between too much. It's not well, like a people theme. have the attention span of a gnat. So yeah, yeah, I I get why they're like okay, flames and what was the performance where Diddy had like they were putting it together right up until the last minute. He had people jumping on the on the foot things and yeah, like those weird trampoline things. things. And mm-hmm. weren't there like wasn't like pyro and background and yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, like everything is for a moment now. Everything is segmented. Like any other performances that you find at like the VMAs that just came on a few weeks ago, you could just carve it right out and just plop it right on the Twitter and you wouldn't even know that it was the VMAs. It's just a moment. That's very true. That's that's absolutely true. Yeah. Thank There's you no for composition. tuning in for another episode of Take of Space Podcast. I am your host, Leah, joined by Jason. Thank you so much for being here. <sighs> Notice she didn't say Professor Jason this time. No, I, I'm <sighs> I'm making sure that you are your own identity. Plus, he's on sabbatical from teaching. <laughs> <laughs> How are you enjoying sabbatical? It's been, what, two weeks? This is the start of my third week. So, yeah, it's been two weeks. Technically not a sabbatical, but sabbatical from actually teaching mm-hmm. different position. It's weird because... I'm, I think I was, we talked about this a few nights ago, just me giving up a certain degree of um, autonomy mm-hmm. and just being able to move freely. I'm not used to being like a nine to five person. I think that's been established by the fact that I haven't had a nine to five job since 2012. But um, yeah, I'm enjoying it because like as soon as five o'clock hit today, I closed my Chrome, my Chrome browser and I was done. I closed my emails and I was done. And I don't have to think about anything else until 1030 tomorrow morning. Oh, then that's nice. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I don't have papers to grade. What? I don't have students <laughs> emailing me asking for extensions. What? Well, something something that I found interesting was that you had to make the decision to leave right after school started because you got accepted into a new position or a new position was offered to you mm-hmm. like just a few weeks into class literally the week that classes started they called me that monday to um or they called me the week before classes started like the thursday before Mm -hmm. um and they were like hey you still want to interview for this position mind you they had first talked about the position being open back in may Ah. but the way that everything happens with hr and higher education it turned into a three-month process so They called me for the interview that Thursday before classes started. I interviewed the Tuesday that class, like the first week of school. And Mm -hmm. then by that Thursday, literally 20 minutes after I taught my first class and introduced myself to the students and like, oh, yeah, for the research project, we're going to be choosing our own topics. You guys are going to have complete control. You can even make documentaries and podcasts if you want. They called me 20 minutes after that meeting and say, hey. We want to offer you the position, but because you're faculty, you can't teach at the same time. So you have a choice to make. <laughs> and it was hard. It was really hard. 
But I'm it glad was, you made I'm glad you made too. the decision to step away from teaching if if only for a moment yeah. to to branch out and try something different. Mm-hmm. Um this episode is part of a series, a larger conversation that we're having about education pre and post quarantine ish because some people are still quarantining and some people still realize that we're in the middle of a pandemic still. Yes. So with that, we've talked to many people from elementary educators. Um, We're hoping to talk to more educators to get their input and where they take up space and how they're getting through it, whether they're in admin or in the classroom or uh, paraeducators or other faculty. So I want to, I want to talk to you because you're on the higher ed side. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see the effects of this in the next few years. We're already seeing it. (laughs) Remember we're 18 months into this. So we're seeing people who were juniors when it first started. Oh, right. Yes. And what I was talking with other teachers, what I found out was they're noticing large gaps in education where mm-hmm. students come come to them and they test at the beginning of the year and the student is one to two, sometimes three grades behind. So as a professor, did, I don't, well, maybe you had a conversation with your colleagues because you're not teaching this semester, but mm-hmm. Even in the spring semester, did you notice that students were lacking or that you had to kind of slow down your style of teaching so that they would be able to get comfortable with, hey, sentence structure, paragraph structure, Mm -hmm. essay structure? Honestly, I noticed it from that first fall semester after everything shut down. So fall 2020, Mm -hmm. I had already noticed... um, that there was a gap, like there was a huge gap between the students who were just returning students who took years off from um, school versus Mm -hmm. the students who were straight out of pandemic senior year. Um, And so I noticed then like I had to cut one and a half writing assignments that semester because the time management thing was the big thing. Like students didn't know how to write essays, which probably goes further into um, like further back before the pandemic. But mm-hmm. students didn't know how to write essays, and we didn't have the time to teach it because everybody had so much stuff going on. Um, last spring, so spring 2021, the class that I was mentoring, even though I wasn't teaching, in the class that I was mentoring, there was also that same kind of um, divide where you could tell the students who had a lot of support during their online um, journey mm-hmm. versus the students who struggled and who had like maybe unstable internet connection, who had... Um, maybe the parents really couldn't help out that much or they just didn't have the support. So there was a huge difference in the length of the essays that were coming in and the quality of the sentences in those essays. So it was, it was very weird, especially to read their, um, my literacy history essays that semester, Mm -hmm. you could tell like, Oh yeah, I had a lot of support last, last year. And it was bad, but it was a learning experience for me versus the students who were just like, it was a struggle. It's a miracle that I'm here, like that I made it to this class. So you could definitely see the, um, the difference in things. Now, I know that we talked last year about admin wanting to keep students in the classes, uh, whether they were performing or not. Mm -hmm. And is that the same, had had that changed at all from uh, fall 2020 to spring 2021 to now fall 2021? What do you mean keep them in the classes? So if a student wasn't doing well or wasn't able to show up or, Mm -hmm. you know, because still in the pandemic, people still looking for work and making sure that they can support their families. And most community colleges are commuter schools where where students are not able to just focus on school. They have life to live outside of school. And so are is the admin giving you all teachers support i know that there's a tutoring center but do you feel that admin is offering adequate support for those students who lack the resources to be as successful as those who are well supported at home yes and no um 
there there are like programs in place like you can they the students can get the chromebooks and stuff the mm -hmm. online tutoring um the online counseling and stuff mm -hmm. i think the problem is that a lot of students don't know that a lot of those resources are there oh. like the laptops that's one that they were really driving home for students from the very beginning but as far as making sure that students take advantage of like appointments like all those resources just like so they can talk to people and have people help like help guide them through this process mm -hmm. um i don't think that there's enough good support i think a lot of it is sort of in place um almost to say that it's there just so they can be there just to say oh we're trying this we're doing this for the students <laughs> but without much um follow-up to make sure that the student that is the support that the students need because I've had students actually tell me like, okay, yeah, it's good that they're giving us food and stuff, but we need cash, like give us cash so that we can pay our bills and not have to worry about stuff or um, right. like that kind of thing. So, yeah. I mean, food's not going to keep your lights on. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it will. I don't think we've hit, hit, hit the bartering stage yet. No, I don't, I don't think we're bartering at this point. Not yet anyway. So what kinds of impacts do you feel aside from, um, well, actually, let me back up. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was talked about previously was the loss of structure or mm -hmm. the lack of structure, whether there was structure previously where students were taught, hey, you have to sit down in your classroom for the entire period. Right. You have to ask to get up to go. But then the students in primary, secondary school were at home. So they could do whatever they want mm -hmm. and they could while out whatever they wanted, you know, turn their cameras off, have their cameras on if they want, things like that. And if they didn't have someone at home, they were just on their own. Mm -hmm. Are you noticing that in, not just in their academic writing, but in their behaviors? that you're experiencing the same thing? Um, early on, like the first two semesters, yes, there were issues just with um, keeping people on task with doing the work. Mm -hmm. Oddly now, I think everybody's sort of fallen into step with how online schooling works mm -hmm. and how it's not like um, online school was before where it was just like, okay, we're just gonna give you these assignments and you do them on your own time. Everything is a lot more structured than I anticipated they would be. Like oh. the I did an um did a what is it like a seminar? Not a seminar, like a institute thing for mm -hmm. designing online classes last summer. And so one of the big things that they talked about was like, yeah, plan your entire course out, have all the weeks set up, but only release one week of content at a time so that students don't get too far ahead, so students don't get too overwhelmed. Um right. early in the pandemic a lot of people were just putting all the content online and just thinking, okay, manage your time. Now it's a lot more structured and scaffolded so that um, students don't get so overwhelmed. And it's actually reflecting in the work that they're turning in and how often students are showing up to like appointments online in the writing center, how often they're actually reaching out for help with stuff. Hmm. Um, so that's actually taught me a lot about just scaffolding assignments. Well, cause I'm somebody like, I would actually prefer personally, I would prefer if you just give me everything at once and then I can just do it. Mm -hmm. But I can see why um, students would like that, especially if you just starting out in college, why they would need more structure. So yeah, I would just, I would rather know how long I need to be here. Yeah. And that way, as you give me assignments, I can just do them, but don't tell me everything at once. Right. That's how it was with the online class that I took over the <laughs> summer. They released one week of content per week or, um, yeah, every, each week they released a module of content. And it was so frustrating for me because I would finish most of my stuff by Wednesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday or Thursday. And then it's just like, okay, I would like to get ahead of it so that like when we go camping, I don't have to worry about it. When, when I go to my mom's house, I don't have to worry about it. But then that group project hit and I understood why it was scaffolded like that. So, yes. So, what are some ways that you feel students can be more supportive going into higher ed or what, what are some things that they should be prepared for? You know, they, they've been in quarantine ish for,
for mm -hmm. you know the past year and now the this year most most kids are back in school full time yeah and i mean we're at uh, the country's at about 58 percent uh fully vaccinated mm -hmm. um and and school districts so far that i know of um are or at least the people who I know, my family and friends who have kids in school, when kids do test positive or somebody tests positive, that whole class is out for for the two weeks. But if they have siblings, funny story. Hmm. Um. So actually, at our campus where I teach, where I won't name it, um, but <laughs> you probably know where it is. Um. Apparently, someone in a class tested positive mm -hmm. and so the class was quarantined and um in the computer lab next to the writing centers i was told that someone peeked in there and there was a student in there working apparently that student was from the class that was supposed to be quarantined so they were on campus in the computer lab because they didn't have for whatever reason they need to use one of the computer labs um computers mm -hmm. and so the instructor of that class was telling um administration they're like okay um yeah i get that we have like an honor system that we're just going to trust students to or trust people to quarantine themselves but i can clearly see that this person is on the zoom call in like at school right what are we going to do about this so long story short there's no kind of support no not support but no kind of um tracking system between just even the buildings on our campus oh. um so if something happens in a building on our campus it um we just have to hear through word of mouth they'll quarantine they'll notify the people in that building but they won't tell everybody on campus because students only go to one building when they're on campus huh yeah i don't quite remember your original question but what was it i just <laughs> to share that because that was concerning <laughs> no i was i was asking more so how how can students be prepared, students and possibly mm -hmm. their parents? Because some students still have the support of their parents while they're yeah. going to school. Um, but, you know, coming straight from high school, whether you're going to a four year or a two year, how can they make sure that they're set up for success? Because you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. But there, what are some things that they could figure out now? I think the big thing to remember, like the biggest thing is that um, there aren't a lot of, we don't know how long this is going to go on. From what I'm hearing that um, it's probably going to be like 50% or more of our classes in, in my district are going to be online moving forward. That's like the new norm oh. starting in the spring. Okay. So this online thing is something that's going to be very prevalent basically throughout your entire college career. Mm -hmm. So you should recognize that, yeah, before with certain classes, you were sort of just like sort of lost in the mix and mm -hmm. uh, your professors wouldn't know about you. That's sort of, um, that's multiplied tremendously now. Like mm -hmm. sometimes some classes don't meet at all on Zoom. Um, sometimes you don't have your pictures on the website or anything like that. So I would say the biggest thing is to, um, reach out to your professors. Even if you just send them a quick email, even if it's a class of 100 students, send them a quick email at the beginning of the semester, like, hey, Professor Melton, just introducing myself to you, um, just so uh, you know who to look out for if I have any questions. Um, that goes a long way. We actually notice those kinds of things. And it's not mm -hmm. like we just ignore them. Even if we don't respond to them, mm -hmm. we notice them, especially if you send them early in the um, semester. Right. Um, so I would say take advantage of all the resources out there your professors are a resource they're not just somebody there that's going to just dump information into you mm -hmm. you may not always agree with them they may not always agree with you but in the end for the most part 99 percent of your professors really just want you to succeed but we can't make you succeed so part of that success is you reaching out to us whether it's for feedback on something that you got an a on or mm -hmm. something that you failed get feedback from us so that we can tell you what went well and how you can improve um same goes for other campus resources reach out to the counselors follow up with the uh, tutoring services that are there even if you don't think you need the tutoring services book an appointment maybe within the first week or so that they're open just so that you can get familiar with going in and or going in virtually and meeting with the tutors 
get familiar with the process of booking appointments and stuff, figure out which tutors work well for you. Mm -hmm. Because then that way, once you're later on down the line, when you have the, um, the assignments to do the midterms, the finals, the um, research papers and stuff, once those are coming due, you know who to book right from Jump Street. You know, okay, I want to book an appointment with Jason because everybody does, or I want to book <laughs> an appointment with such and such because Jason's not available. But you know who to book with and you know their availability and they can get familiar with your writing style and your um, study habits and everything early in the semester instead of when you're just in that stressed out state. Um, so take advantage of all the resources that are there. Um, frankly, I spend in this new role that I'm in, I spend too much time just sort of sitting at my computer figuring out like, OK, I hope they show up for the appointment or I hope somebody books appointments. Um, so I, I just want more people. I want you guys to annoy me. I want you. I want to be in a position where I'm like, oh, my God, will they just stop booking appointments with us? That's a better position to be because then I know students are looking for help instead of right. just sort of hoping and wishing and wanting. So even more so than when we were in college, it feels mm -hmm. like this is absolutely an individual. Like, and I'm not saying that there was handholding previously, but at least there was an office that I could physically go to. Mm -hmm. There were people I could physically talk to who could physically point me in the right direction if I had questions. Mm -hmm. But now knowing that every, most things are online and from what you have explained, if I was a student coming into, um, coming into a university or a community college or a junior college or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it would feel like, okay, now I'm just a number. How do I stand out from being just a number to being someone who can get assistance if I need it, uh, whether I am academically on par or if I'm behind? It, I'm, I'm going, I may need help at some point in time, not just with uh, food or expenses, yeah. but I need academic help. Maybe I'm not where I need to be. And maybe the courses that I'm taking is not the right major that I need to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for something, you know, else. Yeah. So academically, you talked about finding a tutor who knows your study habits. Mm -hmm. What kinds of preparations, if they're not doing it now, whether they are junior, senior in high school or thinking about going back to school? I know time management is a big one, but mm -hmm. what what kinds of study habits should be built up or prepared for? I think one of the things that I think is um, undervalued right now as a study habit is just the opportunity to take chances with stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause mm -hmm. a lot of students are scared to fail, which is rightfully so there's um, there's some legitimate and um, validated concern about failing. Yeah. But I think that um, push to make sure that everything is perfect the first time, that has sort of um, devalued failure. Like there is value in failure. Mm -hmm. So I think at least with what I try to do, even with my classes when, I was, when I'm teaching or in my tutoring sessions is create opportunities where um, students can try stuff out and then just see if it works. So I think one thing that you could do is – maybe just Google like writing strategies and just go down the list and think of, okay, these are some that I've tried. Um, this is just writing, for example. These are some that I've tried or these are ones that I haven't tried. So, okay, then bring them to the um, tutoring session or something. And then we can figure out, try out the ones that you've never tried before and figure out, okay, does this work? How does it feel when you're doing this? Does it make you more anxious, less, less anxious? Um, or you can do that sort of analysis yourself. You can just try the things out and then either figure out like, oh, okay, this actually worked really well. I got some really good ideas from this, or I remember the information a lot better. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try this out. Um, part of that does go back to time management and planning because you want to make sure you leave yourself enough time so that you're not trying new stuff out like an hour before the um, quiz is due on Canvas. <laughs> Look, it's happened, okay? So – that could be part of your procrastination. It could be like a low stakes, like, okay, I'm just going to test this out a week before the assignment is due or maybe three or four days before the assignment is due. Mm -hmm. And if it goes to crap, then that's okay because it is an exercise in learning. 
part of learning is failure. You just have to kind of go with it sometimes. Right. Um, to that end, as someone who is chronically anxious, which we've talked about extensively before. <laughs> yes. I get that there is genuine fear in failure. So part of um, actually having that control failure go well is to make sure that you do have a good support system there. Make sure that you're talking to your parents if they're supporting you, mm -hmm. um, not just financially or anything, but if they are there supportive of you, then talk to them about it. Talk to your friends about it. Talk to your classmates. Reach out to your classmates, really. Like a lot of students just are not doing that anymore. Like nobody is making friends in this virtual space. Right. And that is a big part of the college experience that I think a lot of students are um, going to miss out on if classes aren't structured um, carefully, if they aren't structured to build that community. Um, that's another story. Maybe we'll talk about it a little later. But no, I, I want to get into that a little bit yeah. because <laughs> it's because we, I mean, for 15 years, maybe. University of Phoenix was talked about so bad mm -hmm. because, oh, online school is not real school. Da, 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 da. And, you know, you, you attend class once a week uh, on a Tuesday or Thursday and then everything mm -hmm. else is done online. Uh, the, the college experience is about the connections that you make with other people. How can you make those connections virtually? Well, in this space now, your, your campus <laughs> is doing 50 percent online now like 50% virtual, how is it expected that, or how as a student, are they are they supposed to reach out? Because a lot of students are like all at the same time, like I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. Like, what am I, what am I doing here? I guess I talk to the professor, hear from the professor, ask a question if I need to do my assignments and then I'm out. Mm -hmm. That is actually one of the big challenges that we're having um, even with me working with the writing center now, um, a lot of stuff is just outreach and how do we get more people to come in and how do we create engagement between the students instead mm -hmm. of just making it like, oh, you're just coming to this appointment and that's it. We're mm -hmm. trying to find ways to maybe have events like off campus, but like outside and stuff that are safe, mm -hmm. but also for the students who are a bit more apprehensive about being in public to create virtual spaces like that and to create like raffles and things. Um, I think one of the things that students could do, and I wish, oh, I wish they would do this more, um, just reach out to your peers for help, especially like if you miss a class or something. Um, it goes both ways, actually. Be receptive for your peers to reach out to you for help. Like if they miss something or if you, you're both or if you just feel like I have no idea what to do with this assignment, be open to you getting a blast email from your peers as opposed to just the professor like if somebody's sending you messages like hey can we schedule our own google meet or something like our group um study session or something be open to that has that I think ever a lot happened i want it to happen i actually oh, encouraged gosh, geez. i was i was before, like i've been in two wait before i abandoned my students this semester <laughs> um <laughs> you did not abandon before them. <laughs> no, before I left that class, I was pushing so hard for them to just be like, okay, if you miss a class, if you miss a Zoom session, reach out to your peers. Or if you want to, um, you want feedback on like your topic sentence, sentences or something, reach out to your peers. Because they have the Canvas inbox there. But I think a lot of students are concerned about um, being perceived as like weird or um, being like, labeled as like a creeper or something yeah um which it sucks because there are people who have taken advantage of having that kind of access to their peers to where we have to close that off mm. um that happened to one of my friends that teaches at another college out here um so yeah in her class i mean but well see that's 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 really I mean, that's a valid point and we always have to worry about the trolls and the creeps yeah because even um, KK had a um, KK's in school for mm -hmm. graphic design, and she, one of the first courses that they did, and it's an online school. One of the first courses that they did uh, that she did, the teacher said, "Hey, everyone, I want everyone to get to know everyone. So post a picture or a video and give us a little bit, a little bit about yourself." 
And one of the first comments was a guy just like, it, it could it could have been completely innocent on his part, but just the way he came off was like he was sliding in her DMs. And this is on a public post in the classroom. Do and you was, realize that happened to one of, like in one of the classes I was mentoring last year? I think it was back in the fall. Like they had to post videos introducing themselves. And one of the dudes came in and was like, first of all, you're very pretty, LOL. That's you know? that's something close to what he said was that, oh, you you have a it wasn't that you had a beautiful smile. It was something it was something else. But he was complimenting her physical appearance, nothing mm -hmm. in her bio, nothing she was wearing or anything like that. And said. I was just like, he read the room a little bit. Like, even if she was receptive to that, other people may be mm, guy. Yeah, it's not doing? appropriate. It's 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 exactly like if you're in class and everybody's standing up to introduce themselves and then you come after her like, hey, first of all, I just want to say, love your smile, beautiful hair. <laughs> right. Like, it's like, weird. Mm, and the teacher mm. would reprimand them in that in that um in that context. But I is there a line that people because I feel like I feel like there is a line, but it's mm -hmm. blurred because people, a lot of people uh, who grew up with the Internet don't really understand that there is a code of conduct that you can do whatever you want on Twitter, TikTok and Instagram, whatever. But when you enter in a professional or academic setting, you're no longer on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, yeah. whatever. Yeah. There are no boundaries. Um, on on the internet, we learned early on that there are no boundaries, but we're in a weird position where we started on the internet where we basically tried to hide our true selves when we were starting out in the, on the mm -hmm. internet and tried to like hide a lot of stuff. Whereas like these newer kids, they came up with the internet, so they don't know anything other than to just be the exact same way on the internet wherever oh, they no, are. This the is internet. my house. I'm right down the street yeah. from here. I like go wherever to this they school. are on the internet, there's no differentiation between being in like your boss's office Zoom room mm -hmm. versus being on Twitter. And so one of the challenges that um, I realized that I had was um, like that second semester, well, last time I taught my own classes, actually, the second semester, fall 2020, um, before I abandoned my class. No, I'm just lying. <laughs> That second semester, I realized that there was that blur there and I had to spend a little more time like teaching just basic internet civility and having like maybe three pages on my canvas shell just built out specifically for, okay, this is how we conduct ourselves in the class so that we can be respectful, mm -hmm. um, don't harass anybody. And when I was typing it or when I was copying it from the website and giving credit to the website that I got it from, um, I, I was... <laughs> looking at it like do i have to do this like is this necessary really but then i looked at one of the my colleagues that i was mentoring for that semester and she didn't have anything like that and that's where that comment was made where it was oh. like complimenting the physical appearance and so it's weird like we have to at least in my field i felt like i was having to teach writing and teach people just how to conduct themselves on the internet and just be respectful and then also teaching students how to um, take care of themselves mentally because a lot of people were just having to be frank like mental breakdowns basically like just really losing it and then it's like the world is crashing down on these students but we have to we're in college so we have to keep acting collegiate like it's it's weird i it's, think aren't mental breakdowns a part of the collegiate experience is it not i don't think i ever had one I think I may have had one. The only time I can think of definitely had one was um, my quarter life crisis. Um, <laughs> right before I turned 25. Yes, I call it a quarter life crisis. Apparently, I'm, I'm timing myself at 100 years. <laughs> but yeah, that was when I had my um, first one. That was when I was like, oh my God, I'm balding. That was when I first started noticing I was balding. Um, look at Wait. Me now. There was a lot going on. Where? 
You were in, were you in your master? No, you weren't in your master's. At that nope. Point. I was at the internship, but um, yeah, the labor union internship, which yeah. was something like that didn't help my quarter life crisis situation mm -hmm. because when I started that, yeah, this is off topic, but I'm gonna give you guys the rundown. When yeah. I started that internship, maybe like a week or two before I started it, um, I found out that because I did so poorly in Shakespearean class. I wasn't able to apply to the um, credential program. Um, and so that completely just shot yeah. down every plan that I had. And so then I got that internship, was, which was, it was a lot of fun. It was great, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I was just in a really weird position where it's like, what am I going to do with my life? But um, yeah, yeah, that was a fun time. I feel like this, I feel like naturally having a breakdown is a part of the collegiate experience because everybody, everyone who I knew in college had, whether they changed their major once or a dozen times, mm -hmm. they've had some sort of breakdown, especially with finals coming up. Finals were never a big thing to me. It was more so um, debate tournaments really just like brought out a lot of emotions and mm -hmm. Um, not all of them are positive, and so I just like, yeah, that. Oh my gosh, yeah, I just remember like being upset at you guys' house because they paired me with someone who hasn't debated before, but he was like, Oh, I'm a parley debater, I did it in sixth grade for like a day, and I was just like, Oh, I remember that. Oh, I spent a few hundred dollars because camp is not cheap. I spent a few hundred dollars going to camp in Arizona just to be paired with someone who think they can debate. And that whole like tournament was, oh, that was yeah. terrible. I remember that tournament. I, well, no, I remember your reactions and, oh, you were so mad. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 didn't want to do debate anymore at that point. No, you didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to debate anymore. That was, oh, that was rough. Yeah. Oh, that was rough. But yeah, um, actually, I had two situations that were like, they're both involving debate. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think the only other one that I had was probably, I know there was one after my aunt passed um, my last year or my last semester at Sac State um, because it was my last semester and there were a lot of projects in place. And so that was actually one of the first semesters where I was open with my instructors about what was going on. Cause I had one instructor for three classes. Um, and so like with certain stuff, she was just like, okay, just, just log out, just leave us alone and deal with your family basically. Um, so that was the closest that I got while I was in school Everything for me sort of hit at that in-between phase, like before I went to grad school. So 2013, basically, that's when I um, basically had my breakdown. When I was watching My Mama Can Throw Down on TV One, Google it. <laughs> that was my rock bottom. I think I probably applied for grad school like maybe oh a week after that. That was really a show. I watched the entire series. It was only one season. I think it was one season. But I watched every episode that they had available. In one day, because remember, I couldn't find a job and I didn't know what to do with my life. And honestly, by the time I was midway through that, I texted Jordan, my twin, and I was like, this is rock bottom for me. Like, this is it. Like, this is really bad, but this show is good, but this is bad. Like, <laughs> this is bad. They really made that a show. I can. Yeah, yeah. And there was a woman on there who would like reach into the grease with her bare hands. And yeah, cool I've seen I because that one I think start that they clip that and that start floating around on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that's that was like right around the time Instagram started being a thing. Yeah, I don't think they had but, videos on Instagram that no, yeah, but yeah, it was no, starting it was pictures, to but the up. video the video was on YouTube and Facebook. For yeah, sure. probably Vine or something at that point. Vine. But yeah, that was my, um, my, my crises usually come, um, in the off season, basically mm -hmm. like in between <laughs> schools. <laughs> so this is, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, students need to be, um, 
mindful of that so that when it does happen, when they do reach that point where they feel like they have had enough, mm-hmm. that they have people that they can reach out to and um, people that aren't going to judge them, basically. Right, right. So in, how do I want to say, how do I want to say this? I don't know what I want to say. Give me a minute because I had a question, but I was letting you finish. And so I was like, write it down. No, you're going to remember. Didn't happen. Anytime you tell yourself you're going to remember it, you're not going to remember it. It's a joke that myself plays on myself. Yourself is so twisted towards yourself. I, it is. I don't know what she. I don't know what she's going through. What game she's getting at? But we're going to be alone forever. If she doesn't get it together. Um. So, in knowing those who are looking to pursue higher ed, mm-hmm. coming out of you know the the quarantine because we're still in the pandemic people are saying oh pandemic's over blah blah blah. nope still happening Mm -hmm. so those who are coming out of quarantine and looking to enter in higher ed what are what are some support systems that they could put in place and how can the people in their lives offer better support so if you had to say hey you know if you know somebody in school if you know somebody in school, understand that the way that college is now is nothing like you're used to at all. So you can't compare whatever they're complaining about mm-hmm. to whatever we experienced. Um, and I'm very careful about um, not doing that when I'm working with students in the writing center and when I'm working with my students when I'm teaching, mm-hmm. because I understand that what they're dealing with is completely it's new to me. I'm figuring out the system. So I can't imagine them actually trying to get a degree and paying thousands of dollars um, trying to navigate this. So don't compare whatever they're talking about, whatever they're venting about, whatever they're celebrating. Don't compare it to what you're going through Mm -hmm. because getting an essay turned in by 1159 PM on a Sunday night is probably harder than getting an essay turned in when you have, or meeting a class twice a week for an hour and a half at a time. There's a, lot of stuff going on so don't discredit them so that's the best kind of support that you can provide um if they try to notice when they're seemingly overwhelmed especially if they're like your kids or your siblings or something try to be more mindful and um more aware of their mannerisms and stuff because Mm -hmm. students in general try to hide things. And I say this as a lifelong student, and I say that I say this to a lifelong student, you, Leah. Um, we try to hide things from people because we just tell ourselves, oh, it'll get better. We'll we'll fix it. It's it's gonna work out in the end, but it'll keep building up. Mm-hmm. And we don't know when to pull back because we feel when you're a student, if you feel like you when you're a student, you feel like if you pull back, you're gonna fall behind because that's sort of what a lot of teachers make it seem like. Right. Um right. So try to be aware of people's tics and stuff. I learned when Jordan was in grad school, I learned that one of his things is he won't eat. If he, <laughs> if he's he really comes out of anywhere, he turns into like the zombie that's walking around. I'm like, yeah. And he will not, he won't, he, he will not eat and stuff and he won't go out and everything. And so I'll try to like, make sure like, okay, I'm cooking more. I'm trying to take care of him because I know that's one of his things. Mm -hmm. Um, So just be really mindful of those kinds of things because you can catch it early on to where you can just tell somebody like, hey, let's go out. Let's go take a walk or something. Let's go to the park. Let's go watch a movie or something. There are safe things to do outside the house. There are, even if I'm not doing them. I'll admit that. Um, (laughs) But try to learn some of those things. That's how you can support people Um very very well um and also just try not to put more stuff on their plate because a lot of my students now are extremely overwhelmed with trying to take care of their siblings helping um like working full-time and then doing school part-time or vice versa um and it's not like they can say no to their parents really like especially if they're living at home they may be in a position where they have to contribute and that's completely understandable Mm -hmm. but also understand that if your kid is living at home with you and they're going to school and they're contributing, there are other things that there should be some give on 
like mm -hmm. just so that they can um do this thing that you're probably encouraging to do them to do anyway which is right. college um and also honestly if somebody says college isn't for them don't push them to go to college like that's a big part of yes. what i'm realizing right now it's like okay Absolutely. college is, is not for everyone is there not. are other ways to learn um different skills there are writing seminars to test things out so you can not um spend a bunch of money at first and then mm -hmm. test it out and see okay do i like this then you can start to figure out if you like graphic design and computers and um what else do they go to school for business management or business administration right yeah there's all types um, of certifications for those specific things now there are what are they called MOOCs like the really like the small modules of um just like course content that most of them are free that you can get from like you can take from Harvard you can take from all these different schools and everything just to mm -hmm. test it out especially in this space where everything is digital you're not really missing out you're actually you can get this content for free for the most part and then figure out if you actually like it and then see if it's something that you want to pursue right and don't beat yourself up too much that's my advice to students in general don't you know what you're going through you know what you can handle right. um be patient with yourself and be compassionate with yourself because that body that is sitting in front of your computer is getting you through a pandemic at the same time so it's under a lot of stress so give yourself credit and be compassionate right well thank you so much i appreciate you having this conversation with me can you tell people where to find you or if anything that you would like to plug beside the whatever beside the socials if you have uh resources or um any events or anything that will be talk helpful to, to students talk to your local writing center like find out even if you're not a student at the community college talk to your um contact the writing center just figure out what they're about figure out um what kind of things they're doing to um increase outreach and stuff Mm -hmm. um because we're trying to get students in we want them to be in person or we want them to be online but a lot of times students just don't know about the um the resources are there if you're listening you could reach out to your community college find out about it and maybe tell a student in your life about it Thank spread you. the word and then you can also find me on um the socials at jj underscore newberry do you realize that I still almost say underdash all the time? You do. That pause is there. You have to think about it. Underdash. I don't know why. What is the underdash? What's an underdash? My sister texted me after the first time you said that and was just like, underdash? And he's supposed to know punctuation. Uh, well, you know, you can't know everything. No, I don't want to. I wouldn't want to. I would never want to know everything either. Surprise. Life needs to still surprise me sometimes. Yeah, that would be boring yeah. to know everything. I would, uh, yeah, that's why, yeah, no, I'd be fine. <laughs> I'm good. So thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Take a Space Podcast. I'm your host, Leah, joined by Jason. Please make sure to go follow him on his socials at JJ underscore Newberry on Instagram and Twitter. Also, make sure if you are a student, check out the resources that you have at your college. There are many, many, many resources, whether you are a math major, a science major, if you're doing one of the um, liberal arts skills. Like there's so many, your professors, especially talk to your peers, even if it's just a, Hey, not trying to come off weird, but I have questions. Mm -hmm. Like just, just go ahead and reach out. The worst thing that they can do is say no, but the best way to not be weird when you're reaching out to somebody is to lean into the awkwardness and just be like, yeah, yeah. this is really awkward for me too, but I have a question. Right. I really That's need a good way to not be creepy. Yeah. If you if you try to acknowledge the elephant in the room, acknowledge the awkwardness, typically the conversations do go better. But yeah. make sure to follow us at Take Up Space Pod. That's Take Up Space P-O-D on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And also make sure to follow us on YouTube where you can see the podcast visually. And we'll be continuing the conversation of education um, with some other educators. And I'm really, really, really excited about that. So just make sure that you tune in for the rest of the education series. Thank you so much. You have a great one. Bye.